excellent short biography, she was not aware of those letters shame, when yeah. she when she refers to the uh, 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 yeah to the four masters. But there it is. As I say, what did I say? Thirty-four pages. It's quite a good footnote to get, isn't it? It's but so that really has been a, uh, that means, and that's why I said in the forward to uh, uh, to this new book. Uh, that the, um, the, the genealogy of the clan cattle, or uh, particularly, but anyway, all O'Donovans in the senior line, uh, w in which were all the chiefs, uh, is uniquely well documented. And I, as I say, I hope that nobody will be able to turn it up. I'll turn it out, but I very much doubt that they will. So I think that really is, uh, in a kind of a few brief words, and I hope most of them are accurate at any rate, um, will give you some idea of the importance of Dr. John O'Donovan uh, to our clan, and indeed Miriam uh, O'Donovan, in her letter, uh, he says that, uh, you know, that, that she says that, that really it's been her inspiration in writing this clan history. Very good. Uh, so that's about, that's about it, I think. Yeah. All right? Perfect, Daniel. That's good. magic. All right. I, I often, uh, I go, sometimes when I'm up at Bantry House and I read, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. it, it's quite a, a responsibility as well. I hope the information was accurate and nice to see you. No worries. All right, tight. Okay. Good. All right, bye now. <laughs>Jack and Angela O'Brien here in Castle View, overlooking the castle in Castle Donovan. We want to introduce now John Emmett. And John, you've been involved here in this clan gathering. What inspired you to begin it? My first, my first inspiration was my visit here to uh, Castle Donovan in the spring of 1959. A friend of mine, a de Corsi from Kinsale, and I were going back home to the States after two difficult years as Marine lieutenants in Southeast Asia. And uh, we were confused and ready to stop that sort of uh, experience and go back home. We came through Ireland and we came here to Castle Donovan. We went uh, to the stores. We were interested in the military aspects of why a castle here? What's the background of this place? and uh, it jumps out at you. From this spot where the castle sets, if you go over the hill to the north, you're immediately in the valley of the Bandon River and can go downstream to the, to the sea along the river. If you went over one more short range of hills, you would be near Goganberra in the valley of the Lee, and you could traverse the river all the way to Cork City. If you went over the hill to the west, you would be in the watershed of Bantry Bay, which is another ideal port. If you stepped out from the castle, you would immediately be in the very origin of the Illan River, which flows south into Roaring Water Bay. It has the added advantage of having a rather marshy type land around a good portion of the base, which would make attack very difficult. In addition, they had an excellent source of fresh water immediately. And Drew and I came and we decided to stay a while. In fact, we thought we'd spend the evening up there. And we took with us a, a nice supper. He took a bottle of patties and I took a bottle of Jameson and up we climbed to the top. And we stayed too long and we had too much lunch. And at the time it got dark, we decided we better stay for the night because there was no way to get down safely. We stayed the night up there and saw the sun rise and from that experience, that would have been probably March of 59, 42 years ago, I decided what a beautiful, wonderful place, and, and I hope that someday Donovans from all over the world can come home and see it. And that was the beginning. The reality is that I went back to the States, as Drew did, and we went our ways through life. I met the perfect girl, got married, raised a family, and went on from there. Then in the 70s, we began to come back gradually, and we knew that shortly our children would be on their own and we could commence with some sort of reunion. Six years ago, Virginia and I started, and two years later, through meeting Dan, 
Tim, Catham, we begin to, in our own individual ways, to see if we could uh, excite people about it. And it was no difficulty at all. And it's Castle Donovan that's the focal point of our of our homelands. Good. Thanks. Just so, John, what was it that that uh, warmed you to this to this area? We came down in the morning, and it was raining like it is now. You can probably hear the drip drip off the roof here, and it was wet, and we were wet. And the man on immediate, your immediate right, uh, Jackie O'Brien, invited us into his home and gave us breakfast. And the breakfast was nice. But much nicer was the warmth that we got from his family. We knew that we were once again back where we were welcome. We didn't have to prove anything. We had nothing to offer this man. And he had everything to offer us that we needed. We needed to be accepted. We needed to be welcomed, and that, that welcome was so evident to us that it set the stage for meeting hundreds like him. John Joe on my left, who lives down the road a, a mile or two. The same warmth, the same personality permeates the area. This, this is a perfect place for a reunion for a family that, that comes from here. Thank you. Before we go, we want to ask everybody here to sign the banner. This is what we use in the states at gatherings of, uh, of the Irish uh, to attract them to the O'Donovan banner. And uh, we had it nice and uh, perfectly white and green for a while, but we decided that we were going to bring it to the reunion, have people from all over the world sign it, both sides, right side up, upside down. It's pretty blank now, but in a day or two, we hope to have hundreds of names on here. And then we're going to take it to Limerick and put it in a time capsule and bury it. And 50 years from now, when we have another reunion, the children and the grandchildren of those who signed can find their names. Very good. <laughs> we, and now we got to get you to sign it. The first person that signed it was a Donovan from Argentina. Oh, I should have said it. Well, that's okay. That's well, I mean, that's more encompassing. More white. More white. <laughs> Well, we've just come from the uh, Jeannie Johnson, which we see seen out there in Phoenix, and we're here in the visitor centre in Blinderville. Helen here, Helen O'Carroll, has given us a time to tell us about the connection with the Donovan. What's the connection? Well, the Donovan family in Tree actually owned the original Jeannie Johnston, and the 
ship was owned by the firm of John Donovan and Sons. Um, and John Donovan had set up the, the firm in the late 18th century, early 19th century. Now it's not, we're not 100% clear where he originally came from. His wife um, was a woman called Mary Galway and she was from Skibbereen. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, given that Donovan is a West Cork name, the, the likelihood is that he came from West Cork himself. Although a local historian here in town told me once that um, he'd heard a story that John Donovan had come from Killarney, that he'd been a miller in Killarney, but I haven't substantiated that yet. So John Donovan set up the firm there in the same day, well, in the early 19th century, and he really had the firm well established by the mid 19th century, by the 1840s. Um, and he had started chartering ships in the 1820s and 1830s. Um, basically, his, the reason why he started chartering transatlantic ships was to bring a cargo of timber back from Quebec, which you know then was the, one of the biggest um, centres for, for timber exportation um, to Britain and Ireland. Um, so he chartered a ship, sent it over to Quebec to pick up the cargo of timber, um, bring the, the timber back. So instead of sending a ship out empty, he started taking passengers on these, these charter ships. Um, and there was another firm in town doing the same thing, a firm called Hickson's. The Hickson's actually owned the ships that they were sending out. The Dunlans never actually owned a transatlantic ship until the Jimmy Johnston, and they bought that in uh, late 1847, early 1848. Um, and they basically used it as, you know, a passenger vessel, bringing immigrants over to, to predominantly Quebec, and then bringing the timber back, and they what what would happen would be that they'd uh, take passengers on in April, usually around um, early April, and they'd sail out of Tralee mid-April, mid-April, go over to Quebec, take the passengers off, clear the steerage deck, you know, break it down, um, and then have this big long hold for the huge, huge uh, like square timbers coming back um, from Quebec. So that you know they'd have a very quick turnover in Quebec. Um, so that they come back, unload the timber, um, then build up the steerage deck again, and then leave Trini, be ready to leave Trini around the middle of August. Um, never really, the, the, the latest they would have left it would have been early September. Um, again, with passengers, the same thing happened again. So, in, in a year, how often would they have made the trips? Twice, twice a year to North America. And then. So take out the passengers, bring back the timber. Yeah. Take out the passengers, bring back the timber. Exactly, yeah. And then and again then, in the spring. Yeah, but what they generally what they tended to do um, on the way back in the in the autumn winter, um, they'd make it out of the St Lawrence before the river iced up, um, and then what they would do is either um, go to Liverpool on the way back to Tralee, or Liverpool, Cardiff, went to Waterford once, Cork often as well, and the reason for that was to either um, they'd sell some of the cargo of timber in places like that, or pick up more cargo for Tralee, or else. Uh, let off the crew. I mean, like in a bigger port, you have more variety of, uh, you know, greater choice of crew members, or the crew would rather be left off in a, in a bigger port where they'd get, uh, they had a better chance of getting another ship, you know, rather than Trilly would have been a relatively small port, you know. So, and then they'd come back to Trilly and then the, the captain would have a well earned rest, and the ship would need to lay up as well, you know, right. for, and do some repairs because, I mean, you know, it would take a, a fair bit of a battery um, in the ocean, you know. Right, very good. So, what did the boat cost, the ship cost, originally? Well, originally, um, the way they worked out the price originally was per ton, you know, um, and the price would the price would vary, you know. Typically, in this period, it would go between about um, five pounds, maybe to about ten pounds. But roughly around the time that the original ship was built, it was kind of averaging at around six pounds. So, six pounds per ton, and the um, Original ship weighed about 408 tons, so if you work out the maths there, so we're talking really roughly between 2,000, 3,000 pounds, um, maybe a little bit more to build. To actually, that was the cost to build the ship then, um, and that would have been roughly around the cost that the Dunlops would have paid for it. The current project is a little bit more than that. It's um, between about four and five million pounds, um, which comes from a variety of different sources, you know. Okay, which the. Uh Nicholas Donovan, uh, what, who, who was Nicholas Donovan? Well, Nicholas Donovan was one of the elder, the elder sons of John Donovan. There was an older son, but it seems uh, likely that he died young. And Nicholas Donovan was the one, the, the eldest one, the first one to get involved in the business with the father, and then the, the younger brothers did as well. Um, and he was married to Catherine Murphy, 
who was the, uh, of the Murphy Brewery family. Um, and they were very closely connected and, you know, um, it seems likely as well that the Donovans put some money, when the brewery was being set up, as distinct from the distillery now, um, that the, that the Donovans would have put some money into that, uh, into the brewery as well, you know. So they were very, very closely connected and went to each other's funerals and that. And, uh, and you know, they, as well, like the family, both families were very strong supporters of the O'Connells and that. They were quite alike, really, in a number of different ways as well, you know. Um, I should point out as well about the, just to get back to the ship, um, the original ship as well would have taken about six months to build, um, because the man, <laughs> the man who built it, a man called John Munn, he was one of the, the biggest shipbuilders in Quebec, so he actually had two shipyards going to, you know, at the one time, so he, would, I mean, he I mean, on average about four ships per year, he would, you know, he could have two ships on the go at the one time. Where did he build them? In Quebec City. Right by the river. Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just at the, you know, um, at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. Not at the mouth, but you know when it comes down, right down, just where it begins to narrow there. It's Quebec City. Mm -hmm. And it was a, in the mid 19th century, it was a, like, in North America, it was one of them, um, it was a very big shipbuilding centre, you know. Um, and I should point out as well that Henry Donovan, <laughs> Nicholas Donovan's younger brother, um, he uh, married a woman called Kathleen Morris whose father was from Newfoundland. He was one of the, um, oh, he, was, he was one of the big sort of politicians in Newfoundland. He was also very influential in founding the Brompton Oratory, which Cardinal Newman founded in London. Um, and Henry Donovan was knighted for his efforts to get the pier built at Phoenix, which is where the ship is now. So it's a nice uh, well, connection. Turn around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was, I mean, he wasn't the only one who got the Actually, pier built, but he yeah. was the one one of the, the sort of the stalwarts in getting it done. So it's a nice connection now to have the ship down at Phoenix at the moment, you know, which which wouldn't have been built without the efforts of, of, of Henry Donovan. So Helen, what was the life of the uh, boat? Well, it lasted about 11 years, which um, isn't that unusual for a ship like this because they built them fast and, you know, really, I mean, there's an expression for it, which I won't use, but they'd really use them a lot, you know, yeah. um, and because that's what they were into, they weren't intended for a very long life. Um, so what happened the ship was, the Dunlop sold it in 1855, towards the end of, of 1855, because it was no longer, um, legislation had become tighter, it was no longer as easy to bring emigrants on what was essentially a cargo vessel. Um, and also the timber trade was going through a bit of a slump and um, so for various reasons they decided to get out of, of owning a transatlantic uh, sailing ship. They sold it to a man, uh, ironically called Johnson, in uh, North Shields in England and it was used then as uh, a cargo vessel only for the next two years sailing between the north of England, south of Spain, over to Quebec and back in this kind of triangular run for about two years of really, you know, intensive work. Um, and what happened it was in October of 1858 they were coming back from Quebec and with the cargo, it was just a cargo, there was no passengers on board and they had, um, besides the cargo of timber in the hold, they had some on deck as well and what happened was that the, the timber started getting waterlogged um, and so, you know, it took on more and more water so the timber ended up weighing more than the ship. Um, so instead of like, you know, as the kids think with Titanic, go, of it going down like that, it just sank lower and lower in the water. So what happened was that the crew started climbing higher and higher up the mast, you know. So they hung on to the main mast um, for about nine days before they were picked up by a, by a passing ship. They were all picked up and, and taken safely. So they were, they were in a traffic uh, lane Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't have been that unusual at the time, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's why they, they were confident enough that if they clung on long enough that, that someone would pass by and, and pick them up, you know. Oh. Um, and uh, and so they were taken by this ship into New York, all of them safe and sound. And the the Jimmy Johnston was left to sink in the middle of the Atlantic, um, the end of October 1858, and that's that was the the end of of her until it was the keel was laid here so in uh, what, 98. What what brought about the whole resurrection of the of the of the idea to build the ship again? Well, it's kind of a complicated process, really. I mean, in the it really was born out of a number of different projects in both the Trilly and Blenville area, um, going back to the 1980s, which started really with the um, the reconstruction of the windmill here, or the restoration, I should say, sorry, of the windmill here in Blenville. Um, and arising out of that, there was like a local history project, a false sponsored local history project, 
and they did some research into the history of Blennerville, um, which is where the immigrants would have left from on the Jamie Johnston, and the name the name of the ship kept coming up, you know, um, because it was, I mean, it wasn't the only ship to have left Blennerville, and nor was it the only ship to have taken its passengers safely across the Atlantic, but in that particular period of time, it was the most regular one, in that it left twice a year, almost like clockwork, you know, um, probably, uh, you know, sticking to a better timetable than a CIE train, you know what I mean? Care for them. <laughs> um, but so that so when the, when they were doing the the local history project, the name kept coming up, um, and then arising out of let's say the the other another project that went on here was the restoration of part of the Trinity Dingle uh, steam train railway line, um, and then the the genesis of the idea of building of building a ship here at Blenheim to sort of um, celebrate or, or commemorate I should say rather than celebrate commemorate the um, thousands of immigrants who left Ireland. In, in the famine period, you know, and to commemorate their resilience and, and courage and bravery, really, in crossing the ocean and in a, on a journey that would have been fairly uncomfortable, you know, even on a good ship like this, which never lost a passenger, you've got to understand that it's like 45 to 46 days was the average length of time on the ship, and the ship would, um, on average, took about 200 passengers. It's 200 people. I mean, you saw the ship outside and feel it's not that big. No, you it's, know. and the weather this evening made me feel like and this it's is a June. cock. Yeah, yeah. Popping about in the Oh, water. absolutely. And I mean, uh, you know, so that would, I mean, that took a lot of courage um, to go off into the blue unknown like that, you know, not knowing whether you'd get to the other side or not. And, you know, when, when we focus on the really miserable stories of, of, of the coffin ships, which, you know, are, are the truth and, and did happen in that. But we often leave out the fact that for the immigrants who left on ships like this, it was pretty a pretty rough journey as well. So that the whole story of immigration in that particular period was was a, a tough, a rough, tough journey, you know. There's echoes of, of the subject of immigration, which we now have people coming to this country, mm -hmm. which is sort of a turnaround again, isn't yeah, it? In, yeah. in the whole, uh, Absolutely, really. and, and and some horrific stories as well, like that, like the I mean, this would date our video, but that story of of the uh, people from China ending up um, in Dover. In, in Dover, yeah, yeah. That that I mean, those kind of stories would have been current, would have been the, the currency of the day then, you know, of um, ships from Ireland arriving in Canada or the United States with you know, at least 100 dead on board and yeah. another 100 have been thrown over on the way across, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and, and many more sick and dying, you yeah. know. Um, so, like, we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget that, that the, the journey across to the other side was, was very, very tough, but it makes the achievement of the Irish in America, you know, it makes that story all the, all the greater, really, in a sense, you know, that they did so well from themse for themselves, having come from, um, from a fairly traumatic um, starting point in Ireland. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.
thank you very much. Nice How are you? Thanks for all the work you put into this. Well, so it's, Dennis it's is telling me that you've really well. done it. Probably done all. How are you? Good to see you. Well, actually, without you, you definitely look around without his beard. You have to take a double take. You do. You do. Then you realise. Then you realise. So okay you're then. in a very beautiful spot here, aren't it's you? It's absolutely gorgeous, as absolutely. long as the weather holds snow, we'd be Ah, right. yes, yeah, we'll ignore yeah. those grey clouds. That's right. Well, if, the, if the prayers, it's about 500 or under. Well, thank, thank thank they, 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 they should have an influence. They should, they should indeed. Yeah. Okay. They should, they should. They should. Yeah. Are we ready to move down then? That's grand. I should be congratulating you. I'll tell you what all the work you put in. Hello, how are you? Good, good to see you. Hello, thanks very much. How are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, how are things? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, you stay on that side of the line. I'll move, I'll move around to your other side and give you okay. a guard of honour between the pair of us. Thank you. Hi there. Hello, how are you? Thank you very much. How are you? Very well, thanks. Good. Emily, you going to say hello? Nice to you. How are you? Oh, we've already met. Hello again. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. No, we're just good end in it. Yeah. We're well looked after, exactly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that old rector thing. Yeah, the fortresses were right in the middle of everything. The chief of the ah, how do you do, <laughs> chieftain? How are you? I feel well indeed, ma'am. Thank you. How are you? Very nice You're the to chief. See you yes, <laughs> that is right. You yeah, almost not recognise Senator Dennis. I met last night. I see you didn't know me. I met last night. 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 So you well, I still enjoy the wine, so this is all. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I I first of all want to pay my respects to the chief of the uh, Donovan clan, 
and of course to all of you people here, not least the public representatives, and of course we have the only Donovan uh, in the Oireachtas, uh, my colleague Dennis O'Donovan, sitting behind me here. And Can I first of all thank all of you for inviting me along and to particularly thank your chairperson for today because I know from Dennis and indeed very many others the tremendous work that has been put into the organisation of the last few days. And obviously it's not very easy to try and coordinate not only people uh, with the uh, Donovan name and O'Donovan name here in Ireland but indeed to ensure that all of the people right over the world who can claim that particular name and part of the kinship of that clan uh, to get them all together in one place here in West Cork certainly, as I say, takes a great deal of organisation and I want to congratulate all of those for bringing us here today because it's certainly not an easy feat and I know all of the um, tremendous work that has been done to uh, make our surroundings here indeed very comfortable. And as I've said, and as has been alluded to by other speakers before me today, that many of you have come from a very far distance. It took me three hours to get from Ennis, and indeed it took my colleagues Sheila and Michael five hours to get from Dublin. I'm sure that there are many others that can add on very many other hours from coming uh, from such long distances as Australia and Canada. And you have come here to claim what is very much part of your heritage, and as you may have noticed, the title of my own ministry is Our Heritage Places in the Islands, as the Chief has already said. And certainly the uh, issue with regarding heritage is, of course, a very, uh, can take on a very broad sweep. But those of you who have come here have come to, if you like, claim back that particular heritage of your clan and of your family and be able to look on, if you like, this symbol uh, that is Castle Donovan here today. And I know going all through the country of the importance of our particular national monuments. I know too of the wish of not only the younger people, I'm glad to say, but also the older people in the communities to ensure that we as a state can do all we can to preserve and conserve the many wonderful monuments we have and the heritage and the culture that goes with all of that. And I also know, of course, that there is an increasing interest in the whole genealogy uh, in uh, trying to be in a position to be able to trace your relatives and your, your friends in an area. And certainly when it comes to trying to trace family roots, I think, again, this is something that has been updated very much uh, within our national institutions here, not least the National Library and the National Archives. And this will help very many people abroad to be able to trace their own lineage here in Ireland. To further go into their own particular heritage, and this can be done with the help of our own uh, national institutions, not only in Dublin, but indeed we're ensuring that uh, the, uh, that kind of information comes to a more local base right throughout the country, so that it will be easier for uh, people to access that when they're visiting other parts of Ireland. But it's really my very great pleasure to come along here this afternoon and to enjoy the festivities here. I know that you have been enjoying the last number of days and it's a, 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 a really a wonder, especially for our visitors, that they have managed to be able to, to last the uh, social, um, I suppose, the, all the social engagements that you have had over the last while because in Ireland, as you will know, we're well able to enjoy ourselves. We do work and we work pretty hard, but we are able to ensure that uh, we're able to mingle that with uh, a sense of enjoyment and a sense of fun. And of course, that's very much part of our culture too, and that we have a very inclusive culture, and that is uh, perhaps easily demonstrated by our music, our song, and our dance. And I too, along with your chairman today, would like to congratulate the musicians that we have heard, and indeed the dancers that we have seen in their tremendous talents, and uh, been able to uh, give us the pleasure of enjoying uh, their particular skills. Say Australia. Australia. Thank you. Brazil. She needs the angel needs a little help. Can I hear Brazil from everybody? Brazil! Is there a single soul here from Canada? Canada! Hey! Let's do let's that again. Canada! Canada! We've got somebody here from Colombia. Who's from Colombia? Colombia! Hey! There was a young lady here yesterday from France. Anybody from France? 
Yes. She's over here. Hey! Is Germany still here? Is somebody from Germany here? I met somebody yesterday. Hey! Thank you. Germany. All right. We certainly have some people here from Great Britain. Hey! Thank you. This one may not have made it. Is there anybody here from Ireland? Thank you, thank you all. And Italy. Italy. Hey. Thank you. New Zealand. Is Wayne here? I still owe him something. I'll pay him. Wayne, I've got it in the sack. Is there anyone still here from South Africa? I know there's someone here from the United States, but I want to hear you say America. America! <laughs> Thank you. Now, who did I miss? Argentina! Argentina! Hey. <laughs> who else? Did I miss anybody else? From the very bottom of my heart. Thank you. To the name fellow clansmen and fellow clanswomen. When we gathered here in West Cork in the middle of last week, we were strangers to each other, but now no longer. And to prove that, I want you to turn to the person left and right of you and shake their hands. <laughs> gracious is to accompany me to the other side of the bridge to unveil a memorial plaque. Might I ask you to do us the great honor of unveiling the plaque which we have placed here in honor of your visit to us today? There we go. No, it's
Can I invite everybody back to me so that we can start our entertainment?